First Peter chapter 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him, and though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Therefore, prepare your minds for action, keep sober in spirit, fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. If you address as Father, the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Our Father, we praise you together as your children, because you're holy because you're distinct and separated from all that is evil, all that is unclean, separated in righteousness and purity and truth. You are the amazing creator of the universe, and in you we live and move and exist. And you're our Father by adoption through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we believe in your Son, and we love your Son, Jesus, even though we've never seen him. And you, Father, by your grace, have caused us to be born again, to be new creatures, new people in Christ. And we rejoice because the old things have passed away. All those things which we were ashamed of, true of us, we have renounced them and turned our back on them to now walk a new way in the power of the Holy Spirit, in newness of life, 
in love and joy, in peace and patience, in kindness and goodness, in faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Thank you, Lord, that by your power, we are new in Christ. And today we draw near to remember our risen Lord Jesus, to remember him and worship him, the one who suffered on our behalf, who is now glorified, who's been super exalted by your mighty hand. We remember that one and we fix our hope completely on him, eagerly anticipating the day when he comes back for us. And so, Lord, with joy, with hope, with eagerness, we draw near to you to worship you, to remember your son, to be people who are filled with your spirit to offer to you worship in spirit and in truth from our hearts that we would love you with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. And we know the power of your word, Father, because it's that word that you used to bring about the new birth in us. And so as people who've been changed forever by your word, would you continue to speak to us through your word, despite the inadequacy of the preacher, despite our own sinfulness and inadequacies in so many ways that we are painfully aware of, Lord. Yet even so, your word is glorious and living and mighty, and may it search us out May it encourage our hearts. May you expose to us, Lord, any areas of our lives where we're offending you or where we're grieving your spirit, that we might renounce it today and walk in holiness and walk in truth and walk in wisdom and rejoice as we pray in the name of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. As you're seated, would you turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter Five in the Pew Bible, it's page 960. I hope that you had a wonderful Christ-focused Thanksgiving celebration this past week. Uh, just Thursday, we had only part of our extended family. It was a smaller crowd. I don't really remember. It was, you know, high 20s, early 30s, lots of fun. We always have our volleyball game and then lots of food, right? Way too much food. And we give praise to God because he's given us all good things to enjoy but what I really appreciated so much about this last Thursday is sitting there with Donna and our children and our extended family and having a share time and just sitting there thinking the radical difference that Jesus Christ has made in my family. I remember early on before my sister Cindy came to Christ and then even afterwards where the gospel was slowly permeating my family, so many of those family gatherings were foolish and superficial, even embarrassing, and they were not God-centered. They were often just kind of worthless times, and I'm sad to say. Um, but the gospel came to my family through my sister Cindy. I saw the difference that Christ made in her life. I remember the first time I ever heard the gospel downstairs in our uh, three-story house and Cindy getting all of us kids and telling us about Christ who has changed her and the light that permeated my family and changed my family has been remarkable. Sometimes we don't see it in the short term, but when you look over the long haul, I've known the Lord now since I was 15, a good 20 years now, right? Well, maybe a little longer. And in, in that time, right, 34 years, I've seen God change my own life and my family, my extended family. And so that is wonderful. I want to give praise to God because over the long haul as we stop to look for evidences of grace, we see it. We see the transformation of the gospel. We see light. And I rejoice that God has brought light to my extended Phillips family. Well, that brings us to our passage this morning. I couldn't help but think about my family in these terms because this passage has been on my mind all this week. But as we're in Matthew chapter 5, we've finished the Beatitudes, we've talked about the nature, the character of the Christian, but now we're talking about what is our mission, what's our mandate, what are we called to be towards our world? It's great that God has changed us. Isn't that wonderful, like we've just done, we've praised God, and these are sweet times together as the family of God. 
but don't you want others to join us, to be saved, to experience this kind of joy and celebration in the Lord? This is too good for us to keep just among ourselves. We want the people all around us to come to Christ. We so much want our extended family to know Jesus, or people we work with, or best friends, some you've known 50 years, you want them to know Jesus. You want them to come to Christ. So what is our mission? Why has God left us here on planet Earth when so often we'd much rather go to heaven, right? Paul says it's better to depart and be with Christ. Why didn't God just take us home? I want to go there. Don't you want to go there and see the face of Christ? We just read we've, we've never seen him, yet we love him. Well, I can't wait for that day. But why are we here? Why did God stick us in this foul place? this decaying, corrupt, evil place. Why are we still here? That's what Jesus picks up in Matthew chapter five. This is our mission, our identity towards the world. And this is what our Lord says, Matthew five, starting at verse 13, reading down to verse 16. Here's our mission. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, How will it be made salty again? It is good for nothing anymore except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do men light a lamp and put it under the peck measure, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. You are the light of the world. Says who? Says God. Says God, the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to look at that this morning under six points. Let's begin with point one notice, the darkness of the world. Just where we started last week, so we begin there again to contrast this world that is our mission field with God and his people, us. Christ's teaching in verses 13 to 16, they, they give us clear understanding into what the world is really like in its nature, don't they? Christ's words are crystal clear. The Christian has insight. We see things rightly because we've been taught the truth by the one who is the truth. So how does God, God the Son, view our world? Well, based on these two pictures that Jesus, the master teacher, has just given to us, since we as Christians are salt, we have to say we are living in a decaying and rotting world. And secondly, since we as Christians are light, we are living in a dark world, a world that loves to talk about enlightenment, and they love to pretend that they've been enlightened, but they are still in the dark apart from Jesus Christ. Decaying and dark, that is our world. It's not a glowing description, but it is accurate. It is true from the lips of our Lord. Our world is a dark place. Now, do you remember that 1994 earthquake? Some of you I know over here, you weren't even born then, but for most of us we were, and I remember it very well, January 17th, 1994, and I remember it so well because it was the day in which we were moving from Florida back to California. And I remember about 5 a.m. getting a phone call in Florida. I think it was, uh, maybe around then. Someone said, turn on the news. We didn't have a TV, it was packed up. So we borrowed one of our missionary friend's TV and there it was, the, the news was flowing through about this earthquake. The freeway overpasses were down. We couldn't reach my parents. We got through to Donna's folks and heard all about this massive earthquake, the Northridge earthquake. We flew into LAX, and it was dark. I mean, I grew up in the San Fernando Valley. There's always been light, and it was such an eerie experience to come over the city and see it dark everywhere, to drive up to Donna's folks on the 405 and to have no light anywhere. I'd never experienced that, ever. So pitch black, no street lights, no house lights, No building lights, just dark and eerie. And that, my brothers and sisters in Christ, is what the world is like spiritually. 
spiritually. No light that emanates from inside the world. The light has to come from outside of the world because the world is so dark and the world needs light. Why? Well, because God describes the world system, this non-Christian world system, and the sinners living inside of it as existing in this oppressive, enslaving spiritual darkness. In fact, to say it again in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3, Paul says, our gospel is veiled. It's covered to those who are perishing. Why? 2 Corinthians 4, 4, because the God of this world has blinded the eyes, the minds of the unbelieving. They cannot see spiritually. They do not know Jesus Christ. They do not understand his beauty and his greatness. They do not see God rightly in his holiness and righteousness and justice and truth and wrath. They don't see themselves rightly in their unrighteousness, their guilt, their idolatry. The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. Listen now that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. That's what Paul writes. They do not see the glory of God brilliantly shining out from the person of Jesus Christ. Our gospel is veiled to the perishing. And that's why salvation has to be a supernatural work. It cannot be a work that you or I bring about or any sinner. God is the one who has to give light, bring sight to the blind, enlightenment to those who are in the darkness and enslaved by sin. The world is a dark place. That's what we have to remember and understand. The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. 1 John 5.19, Satan, the evil one, He controls this whole world system and every single person in that system. They're going to do his will. They're going to reflect his nature. And that's why this world is so dark. What is he like, the devil? Well, in John 8, 44, Jesus says a lot to us about what Satan is like. He puts it like this. He says... If I can get there. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature for he is a liar and the father of lies. So Jesus says everything about Satan, everything about the devil is murderous hateful, lying, deceptive. And here's the sad fact then again. The whole world lies under his power. That murderous, wicked creature, they are captive to his will. And that means then, let's not have any illusions about this, that our whole world system will reflect Satan's nature and Satan's ways because he is the God of the world. He's the ruler of the world. His darkness and blackness and evil will be theirs as well. Like father, like son, we can say biblically. What he loves, they will love. And so at the beginning of John 8, 44, Jesus says, and imagine having this said to you by Jesus, the the Lord of the universe. He says to these unbelieving Jews, you are of your father, the devil. And you want to do the desires of your father. You are of Satan, your father. And as his children, you bear his nature, Jesus is saying to them. His heart. They actually want to do his desires. They are not kicking and screaming, protesting. Don't do this to us. Don't twist our arms and make us do your will. No, Jesus says they want to do the desires of their father, the devil. They don't want to escape. That's why the unbelieving Jews did not believe in Jesus because he spoke the truth. John chapter 8, verse 45. They could not understand or hear his word, John 8, 43. And so we have to say then that God must supernaturally invade their darkness and open their eyes and rescue them out from Satan's kingdom for them 
to be saved. And that is because Satan has blinded them and he controls their wills and he holds them in bondage. And here's the sad fact, they love it that way. They love it that way. We read John chapter three, verses 19 and 20 last week and I wanna read it again. Jesus says, and this is the judgment that the light is come into the world and men loved the darkness rather than the light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. Think of what Jesus is saying about the world. They do evil. They love darkness rather than light. They hate and they reject the light. They run from the light, in fact. Why? Because they don't want their deeds to be exposed. They don't want the light to show them as they are in their ugliness of sin, in their rebelliousness and idolatry, in their unbelief and hatred of God. They have a vested interest in their sin. They have an intentional commitment and love for evil. That's what Jesus says. And they will fight against the light. They will fight to stay in the darkness, says Jesus. Picture yourself exhausted and worn out and you're in a deep slumber and you don't want to be disturbed in the slightest. And one of your children sneaks into your room and shines a powerful flashlight right into your eyes. Now, have you ever had that happen before? And did you respond in a godly way? Were you thinking godly thoughts at that point? What's your reaction? Normally, get out, right? The anger and grouchiness. You probably would not laugh and thank your child. Hey, that was a good one. I'm gonna get you, right? No. Turn that off, right? Don't bother me. That's how the world is toward the light. Turn that off. But you see, they hate it a hundred times more than our silly little illustration. Turn that off and leave me alone. Listen to Proverbs chapter four. One of those very powerful verses that we often forget And this really was us before Christ. In Proverbs chapter four, starting in verse 18, here's the the really blessed description of, of believers. It says, but the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn that shines brighter and brighter until the full day. But by contrast, verse 19, the way of the wicked is like darkness They do not know over what they stumble. What a contrast. On the one hand, as Christians, our lives are filled with light. God's truth shining on us. Our path actually is getting brighter and brighter as we grow. Clearer and clearer as we get closer to Jesus and closer to heaven. Praise God for that. But for the non-Christian, there is only continual darkness and blindness and this stumbling, constant stumbling. I remember again on one of our vacations, we play this game called release. And I remember running in the dark so fast, I was about to dive on the couch ahead of one of my kids to yell release. And I caught this ottoman that I did not see and I broke my toe on that thing and stumbled and fell in the darkness. And there were not godly thoughts in my mind, I do admit it. But running in the darkness... I fell hard. Do you remember your life before Christ? Isn't that a good description? Stumbling, getting back up. Stumbling again, getting back up. Stumbling again in sin. Tripping and falling over sin after sin. They don't even know what they're stumbling over, says the writer of Proverbs, Solomon. Because they can't see. They are spiritually blind. Proverbs chapter 2, verses 12 to 13 speaks of the way of evil and those who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness. They walk in the ways of darkness. In Proverbs 2.14, they delight in doing evil. And catch this, they rejoice in the perversity of evil. They brag about it. Have you ever, have you ever known people like that? 
Were you one of them before Christ? I remember this one summer working for my brother Bill. We were laying fence around construction sites and there would be times we'd work in the yard and lunchtime would come and I'd be with all those guys. And I tell you, the conversation was so perverted and so wicked that I often felt like I couldn't get out of the room fast enough before I heard some of the foulest, most disgusting things that I have ever heard. That's how it goes. And they rejoice. They rejoice in the perversity of evil. That's how dark our our world really is. Listen to another passage, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 to 19. And I'm, I'm hoping that as you and I hear this, we're not saying, yeah, you know, sock it to him, Pastor Paul. How disgusting. But that rather, one, we remember what God has saved us from. And two, we are moved by compassion. That's right, I forget. These people seem like they have it all together around me, but they don't. They need Christ. And we need God's interpretation of their lives to be superimposed over the facades that we see each day at school and at work and among our neighbors. What are they really like? Well, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, this I say therefore and affirm together with the Lord, that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk. Here it is. In the futility of their mind. That's how they live, a futile mind being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart, and they have become callous, having given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. That's our world. That's it. In Isaiah 59, 9 through 10, Isaiah describes the world as walking in gloom, groping along the wall like blind men, stumbling at midday. At the brightest time of day, they stumble like dead men, says Isaiah. That is the darkness of our world, a darkness so great that you can feel it. Don't you feel it getting darker too all the time? We can feel it in and of themselves. It is hopeless for our world. There will not be any solution that arises from within the world. None. Darkness cannot produce light. Darkness does not want to produce light. And so we can expect that the world in and of itself will only get darker and darker. Don't be surprised by that. That's the way it will go. They cannot help themselves. They will only become more and more sinful and evil over time but Jesus talks about light light so let's turn there let's turn to the light what can we say on a positive note who wants to preach just point number one not me I don't want to end there there's so much more we can say so much more on a positive note and so first of all we can say this point number two notice God is light God is light turn over with me to the book of first John And in 1 John chapter 1, we have this remarkable statement. John says, turn there with me, 1 John 1 verse 5. He says, this is a message that he got directly from Jesus Christ himself. And we don't have this message in the gospel, so God wanted John to give it to us in one of the epistles. He says, and this is the message which we have heard from him and announce to you, what is it? That God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. God is light, that's a glorious fact. We can preach that truth. And let me just give you four truths that we can speak out about regarding God. First of all, it is God's nature to shine. Have you ever thought about that? He cannot help it, just as our world in its nature cannot help but become increasingly evil. It is God's nature to shine. That's who he is. He is glorious. He is wonderful to behold. In fact, so glorious that no one can see God and live. And you remember when Moses wanted to see the glory of God, God says, okay, I'll put you in a crevice of a, of a rock and I'll and I'll cover you over and you'll just see my backside. You can't see the fullness of my glory. 
You'll just see the, the trailings of it, so to speak. In Revelation 1.16, the exalted Lord Jesus is described, and we read, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. When Christ appeared to Paul on the road to Damascus, as we studied three times in the book of Acts, but the first is in Acts 9, we read that the light from heaven that flashed around him was so bright that it knocked Paul to the ground and it temporarily blinded him. God shines. It is his nature. And further, secondly, he radiates truth and righteousness. That, that's what light represents in Scripture. Intellectually, it represents the truth. Morally, it represents righteousness and purity. Third, from 1 John 1, 5, God is perfectly holy in light. John says, in him there is no darkness at all, no error, nothing untrue, nothing sinful, nothing questionable. In fact, James says in James 1.13, let no one say when he is being tempted, I'm being tempted by God. Don't say that, says James, because God can't even be tempted by evil. And he himself does not tempt any man. Instead, everything about God is honorable and true and right and pure and beautiful and good, says John. Lovely, reputable, excellent, praiseworthy. There is no darkness in him at all. And then a fourth thing we can say about God who is light is that he hates sin. And he hates all that is evil, all that is untrue and unrighteous and unholy and unpure. It is these things that bring the wrath and judgment of God. So here's the first piece of good news this morning. Though our world is dark and blind and evil and lost, their darkness has not permeated or infected God one bit, not in any way. He is pure light. There is no darkness in him at all. He is perfectly good and holy and true. Evil cannot tempt him. He will never yield to it. He always and ever opposes sin and fully, finally, he will judge it and vanquish it and banish it from his universe one day. That's God. God never grows cold or indifferent toward darkness, never. That is good news, the triumph of light over darkness. May we never begin to think of our universe as kind of this dualism, this fight between equal forces, good and evil, light and dark, not at all. No, God has no equal. He is light and he dwells in unapproachable light and his righteousness and truth always triumph and win the day. Now here's additional good news, point three, notice. We as Christians live now in the light. Now we started in the darkness, and then we remind ourselves God is light and that we too are in the light. Let me read Proverbs 4.18 to you again because this is such a beautiful verse. But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn that shines brighter and brighter until the full day. Now I read to you John chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. Here's John chapter 3, verse 21. But he who practices the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be manifested as having been done through God. So there are some, the world, they run from the light. There are others drawn by God who come into the light. Verse 21, not all hate the light. We as Christians have come to the light and we practice truth and our new righteous life manifests that work in us that has been done through God. Praise him. So God's light, is spreading in the world of darkness and it has come to us and that's why I'm preaching and that's why we're here studying because the light has changed us and we are new creatures in Christ. So notice since we're in 1 John chapter one, notice the wider context. Let me read again verse five and then I wanna read down to verse seven. And this is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, 
We have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So John says, let's start foundationally. God is light. You got that? God is light. To know him is to walk in the light and to fellowship with him and to fellowship with each other. And the foundation of our fellowship is the death of Jesus Christ, which cleanses us and continues to cleanse us from all sin. And then this light, dark contrast continues on into 1 John chapter 2. Look with me at verses 9 through 11. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the what? Is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the what? Abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. So to say it again, we walk in the light. We don't stumble. There's no cause for stumbling to us. Non-Christians, they walk in the darkness up to and including this very present moment. How do you know if you're in the light or in the darkness? John says, through the practice of love. Did you get that? Those who are in the darkness, they hate. They're blinded still. They don't know where they're going. Verse 9, if you profess to be in the light, you must prove it by the practice of love. Because the light, when it comes to us, it changes us. And elsewhere in 1 John, we could say, you prove you're in the light by the practice of righteousness and faith in the true Jesus Christ. Well, God is light, and we as children now exist in the light. And then fourth, notice, Jesus Christ is the light of the world. So turn back with me to John's gospel. And maybe it's been a while, so turn with me to John chapter 1. And let's continue to build this foundation. We started with the darkness. Now we move to God who is light. We who live in the light. And now Jesus Christ towards the world. What is he? He is the light of the world. John chapter 1. Look at verse 4. Well, let's start at verse 3. Jesus the creator. All things came into being by him and apart from him. Nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life and the life was the light of man. And notice verse five, light shines, right? And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Why? They're blind. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. That's John the Baptist. He came as a witness. Verse eight, he was not the light, but came that he might bear witness of the light. But look at the contrast, verse nine. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. So The world in its darkness cannot generate light. Light has to come from outside, and it does. In the person of Jesus Christ, the light, the true light, who exposes every human heart. And then turn over with me to John chapter 8. And let's see this continue in the teaching of Jesus Christ. John chapter 8, Verse 12, one of those beautiful I am statements of Jesus. Again, therefore, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in the darkness, but shall have the light of life. We've been rescued from darkness by light that produces spiritual life. And then in John chapter 9, turn over a page or so. In verse 5, he says, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So now to summarize, when God saves us, he opens our eyes to see the beauty and greatness and majesty of Jesus Christ, the one who is the light of the world. And through salvation, Christ illuminates us. He, He reveals to us our sin and our need for him, and he illuminates his way of salvation through faith. Now here's the exciting thing. All of this about Jesus Christ was prophesied long ago in the Old Testament. Listen to one man, Isaiah. We know Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 42, listen to how he describes the ministry of Christ, the coming Messiah. In Isaiah 42, verses six and seven, he says, God is talking, I am the Lord, I have called you in righteousness. I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you, and I will appoint you as a covenant to the people 
as a light to the nations. He's talking to the suffering servant, the Messiah Jesus. What? To do what? To open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon and those who dwell in darkness from the prison. Christ, the light of the nations, opening blind eyes, setting free those who live in darkness. And then over in Isaiah chapter 49, we have another description of the, the Messiah's future ministry. In 49 verses 5 and 6, And now says the Lord, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, this is Messiah Jesus talking, to bring Jacob back to him in order that Israel might be gathered to him, for I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God is my strength. He says to the suffering servant, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light of the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. It's not enough that Jesus only be light to the Jews. He will be light to all the earth and all the nations. And that's where we come in. So notice with me then point five. We too are the light of the world. Why am I going through all of this? Because I want you to see who God is, who Christ is, who we are. And from that, our mission flows. We understand who we are and because of who we are, what God expects us to do. We too are the light of the world. So go back with me to Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. What does Jesus say? He says, you and you only, by the way, emphatic pronoun, you and you only are the light of the world. That's our nature and that's our mission. We too, you see, are light, just like Jesus is light. We are to transmit and radiate and exude Christ's light out to the world. Listen then, we are meant to be light. That's what God expects of us. Not just in a small way, but to the whole world. And I remind you of what I said last week. Jesus at this point in the Sermon on the Mount is talking to a handful of followers. What a kind of ridiculous thing to say, this small motley crew of followers. You are not just the light here in Israel. You are the light of the whole world. You are the salt of the whole earth. That's pretty radical. That's a pretty amazing thing to say. I don't think I would have said that to those disciples. Would you? I think I would not have had that kind of confidence in them. But really, ultimately, it's not a confidence in them. It's a confidence in what God was going to do in them and through them. This motley little band of followers, they're going to be used by the Almighty God to change the world through Christ. How radical to tell just a, a couple hundred people to go make disciples of all the nations. It's going to be through the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth. So we are meant to be light. That's how we as Christians are to function in our society. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, Peter explains that in salvation, God has called us out of the darkness into his marvelous light, and then in the light, we become proclaimers of his excellencies. That's what Peter says. We're supposed to tell everybody about our Savior and light giver, the one who illuminates and enlightens us through Christ, the light of the world. See, I say all that because it's so easy for us as Christians to, to be here and get comfortable. Isn't it wonderful to pray together and to sing praises and hymns together and be together around people who believe like we do and you know, we, we have wonderful fellowship. What if we could just kind of stay here forever? It's so comfy and cozy and no one ever says anything that offends us. And, and you know, people don't hate us here. They love us and they welcome us. Can't we, can we just kind of stay here? No, that's not our mission. We'll have that one day in heaven, but not now. In Philippians 2 for, uh, verse 15, Paul commands us to be blameless and innocent children of God above reproach. Listen, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, listen, among whom you appear as lights in the world. But I don't want to be around the guys on my football team. Do you hear what they say? It's disgusting. 
I don't want to be around those people in my workplace. They're gross. I don't want to be around my next door neighbor and his crude jokes and the wicked things that he does. You're called by God. I'm called by God to do just that, to be light. They're not going to improve themselves. They're not going to get better. They're not going to moralize themselves. It's going to come from you and me, the light of the world, appearing in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. So God in Christ has opened our eyes so that you and I can see the light and walk in the light and proclaim his greatness for calling us out of darkness into light. But now he wants us to shine his light in this dark world of unbelievers so they can be rescued too. It can't just be us for no more bar the door. We love it here. We love our praise songs and we love to be together with Christians. That's good. Praise God. But it can't stop there. It can't end there. He wants us to rescue the world through Christ, the true light. So back to Matthew chapter 5. Notice the rest of verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. We are this city set on a hill. We are further, he says, like a, a lamp on a lampstand, verse 15. Nor do men light a lamp and put it under the peck measure, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Now here's the point, to say it again. We are meant to be light in the darkness. True Christians cannot be hidden. We are meant to stand out. We are meant to be different, not hide our light, not hide out in our little holy huddle. It's so good just to be together. That's true, but that denies our mission if that's all we do. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Kent Hughes writes, having traveled a little in Ecuador, I can testify that the light of the city of Quito, situated at 10,000 feet, illumines the sky for 75 miles around. It cannot be hidden. Yet when you are in the great city itself, the light from the tiny villages higher above the Andes is easily seen. Cities on hills cannot be hidden. Believers are like this. They are visible. There's no such thing as an invisible believer. Isn't that true? In fact, Martin Lloyd-Jones says, if we find in ourselves a tendency to put the light under a bushel, we must be begin to examine ourselves and make sure that it is really light. In other words, are we really light? Do we really know the Lord if we're hiding out? You see, true Christians cannot be hidden, says Jesus. We will stand out. That's our mission. And we desire to have our lights shine. And that's how we serve the world. We are the light of the world. Now, how does that relate to Christ? How does that relate to the true light of the world? Well, he's like the sun, and we are mere reflectors. Isn't that true? He's the source of light. We reflect his light. He's like the sun, and we're the moon, right? We have no ability produce, to produce light in and of ourselves. We only reflect it. Now, why do I say that? Well, because our difference that we will make in our world is only going to be by being rightly related to Christ, the true light. You see, if you and I are meant to reflect him, the best way to reflect Christ is to be like Christ, to walk with Jesus Christ. It's like he said, if you're going to be fishers of men, you got to follow me. you you got to follow Jesus and know him if you're going to be a fisher of men. you got to be close to Christ and like Christ if you're going to reflect Christ to the world. We will mar the reflection to the extent that we are not like Jesus Christ. That means walking with Christ intimately and seeking to be conformed to him and then we will better shine his light so that our world will see Christ in us. And that brings us to one final point this morning. Point six, notice. Let your light shine to the glory of God. Notice verse 16. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Let me just make several points from verse 16 and then we're done. The first is a question. It's a question. Are you deliberately concealing your light? And I mean by that, 
you're more than happy to tell people here or in the youth group or at the flock or other gathering, you're a Christian, you're more than happy, you're proud of that, you're delighting to say that. But then when you're around the world, do you cover it over? Are you ashamed of Christ? How ridiculous to light a lamp and cover it over, verse 15. That renders the lamp completely useless. So with a Christian who refuses to shine for Christ, listen to Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Flight into the invisible is a denial of the call. A community of Jesus which seeks to hide itself has ceased to follow him. There is no monasticism for us as Christians. There is no retreat from the world. Rather, we run towards the world to reach them for Christ. We must confess him before men for him to confess us before his Father. That's what he says in Matthew 10, 32. And he adds in Matthew 10, 33, but whoever shall deny me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. I can't soften that. I'm not even going to try. I want you to think about that. That's what Jesus says. Those are chilling words. Do you claim to know Jesus Christ? If so, how could you not own him publicly before this world? Do you really know him if you're concealing the light? Do you? Secondly, for us as Christians, I challenge you this morning, avoid anything that darkens your light. See, if our mission is to be light bearers to the world, then avoid anything that tends to snuff out that powerful, influential light from your life. And here Paul speaks to this in Ephesians chapter 5. He starts at verse 3 and he says, But do not let immorality or any impurity or greed even be named among you as is proper among saints, that is, holy ones. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. You cannot share in these things with the world. Why? For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And Paul says, if we didn't get it, and do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light, for everything that becomes visible is light. Paul says, walk in the light, not in immorality and filthiness and impurity, not in darkness, but in goodness and righteousness and truth. Don't join in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but expose them by the light, your light in Christ. Now, two functions of our light. One, our light exposes the darkness, that is true. But that's not where we end. Light also shows the way out of the darkness. Amen? Aren't you glad someone in your life didn't just come and confront you and expose you in your sinfulness, but they showed you the way out through Jesus Christ? That's the good news. That's our job. Lead others out of the darkness and into the light. Matthew 5, 16, therefore... He says, Jesus Christ, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Now that assumes that our lives are marked by good works, by righteousness and truth and Christ-likeness. And that righteous life is going to back up our proclamation of the gospel with this result, says Jesus, with the result of salvation. Unbelievers watching our lives are going to repent and believe they're going to come to Christ and they're going to glorify our Father in heaven. That's what Jesus says. He assumes that we have this potent, effective witness of evangelism and a life that backs up our testimony so that people 
will be saved. Now, negatively, towards the world, we're going to be persecuted. We saw that in verses 10 through 12. But positively, you and I are going to be used by God to save some out of the world in this light-bearing role, this mission on behalf of Christ. And I see that as Christ's teaching and Christ's expectation in verse 16. And I end with this. It's been bothering me all week, and I still just want to think about it and pray about it more, and I want to have it trouble you too. I want you to think about it with me. Here's my problem as your pastor. As I evaluate the American church generally, as I evaluate our church specifically, it's really two parts. First of all, there's no persecution. Why not? Why not? Why aren't we being persecuted? And further, with regard to our church, why is there so little fruit in conversions. Now we're about 250 people. Does it take 250 people to birth one baby? We have an occasional conversion. But why not more? Why isn't God using us to a greater extent as a church? That should bother you. And that should bother me. We should stop and we should pray about that. Why If 250 people or so, if we're gathering for worship, then we're scattering for evangelism, why so little fruit? Why is it more the exception when someone comes to Christ through our ministry? And I got to challenge you with that. I want you to think about that. Are we being light? Are we telling other people about Jesus Christ? Or are we content to be in this, hu- this holy huddle? And it is sweet, isn't it? These are sweet years of ministry for me and for Donna and our family. It is wonderful to be with all of you. But why aren't more coming? Why aren't more being saved? And why no persecution? I don't have the answer to those questions. They're just bugging me. They're moving me to prayer. And I just wanted to unload it onto you so that you're bothered too by that. I wish I had the answer for you. But I want to say it again. We gather for worship, but we scatter for evangelism. And it's your job and it's my job not to get people here to be saved. That's not our model. That's not a biblical model. It's you and me today, tomorrow, this week, reaching people at work who don't know Christ, reaching people in our classrooms who don't know Christ, reaching that guy next door who doesn't know Christ, reaching the hairdresser or the dentist or the grocer, whoever it is. Why aren't we? What's wrong with us? What are we not doing or being as the people of God? That's all I gotta say. I wanna bring that burden to the Lord in prayer with you. Would you pray with me? Lord, we all confess to you there are truly times when we are ashamed of Jesus Christ, when we should speak up, we should be more courageous, we should have a holy zeal, we should tell people who are in the darkness how to be saved through Christ, we should let our light shine more brightly, instead we muffle it and mute it and cover it over. Forgive us, Lord. We see a problem. We see a problem in the American church, but it's always easy to point fingers. We see the problem right here in us as a congregation. And it troubles us, Lord. Why aren't 250 people having a greater impact so that people are being saved, so that people are renouncing the darkness and gladly proclaiming Christ, the one who opens blind eyes. Lord, I don't know the answer, but I desire for you to change whatever is needed in my life so that I would be more effective as a light bearer. And I pray for our whole family, the family of God right here, the PVBC family, whatever it is, many things perhaps, Lord, that need to be removed from our lives so that we can be better, more effective witnesses 
and light bearers to this world. I pray you would do that, Lord. We don't know why we're not being persecuted. We don't know why more are not seeing our good works and glorifying you in heaven, Father. But we pray that this week we would be bold and courageous and shine your light in such a way that many might be saved through the corporate witness of Pleasant Valley Bible Church as we pray in Jesus' great name. Amen.